Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mindful Social. This week, I have Marissa Afton. She's a director and senior consultant for the Potential Project in New York and Denver. She's also an organizational psychologist, executive coach, and corporate trainer with extensive experience in the field of workplace health, safety, and well-being. And she's led cultural change initiatives in organizations across 10 countries and four continents. This woman's got chops. And I'm really happy to have her here to talk about how we can bring mindfulness into the workplace. And this time, we're really going to talk a lot about how we can maybe help HR and really talk about the human and human resources. So Mm -hmm. welcome, Marissa. Thank you so much, Janet. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I appreciate the invitation to join you. Happy to have you. And why don't you tell us just a little bit about what you do with The Potential Project? Yes, and uh, probably also worthwhile sharing about Potential Project and what we do as a whole. So, uh, of course, you mentioned I'm uh, co-located in in New York City and uh, out of Colorado, but uh, Potential Project is worldwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been operating for about a dozen years now. Uh, I think we're uh, hitting about 27 different countries to date and uh, about 350 global clients. So we have been working in many, many uh, multinational organizations in multiple industries, uh, people like Google uh, and Accenture and uh, across IT and across uh, many, many different industries. And, and a lot of what we do is really helping people understand how our current working environment is, is really not working mm. as it relates to uh, productivity and efficiency and what have you. And, and so my piece of that is uh, I, I work very closely uh, with our, within our U.S. operations, uh, both from a support perspective, so not strictly HR per se, but of course I, I do a lot of um, HR-related activities uh, for recruitment and supporting our people and, and uh, development and things that HR uh, specialists can really relate to. Um, but also I'm very much client-facing because I have a personal passion for what we really do um, in organizations and being able to help people in HR and executives and frontline workers and the entire spectrum to really help with their focus and efficiency and resiliency and all of the rest, all of the great benefits that we know uh, mindfulness can take. Wow, that's, that's very important work because I really feel that, you know, HR gets short shrift sometimes, even though their name is human resources, yeah. a lot of people think that it's just resume pushers and certainly that's not all that it is. Um, especially now we're seeing more and more companies are developing more advanced HR programs that are yes. around bringing mindfulness into the company to maintain their human resources. Can you, can you talk about some examples of that? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I think in some of our previous conversations, we were looking at it from two different perspectives. One, that kind of, as you mentioned, that misperception of what HR is and how the individual HR HR um, person, whether they're an HR executive or an HR field leader, um, you know, they've got a lot of pressure on them. The expectations are really, really high. Um, what they're being asked to do in, in what we call a paid reality, and paid reality is just a coin term that Potential Project uh, has been using to describe organizational life. So paid in the acronym stands for P for pressure, you know, this feeling of constant pressure in in corporate life. Uh, A is for being always on. It's like this 24-7, you never can get mental space in your work life. Uh, I is for information overload. And so it's this idea that Things are coming at us. They're coming at us from all different directions. We don't know what to focus on anymore. And D is for the constant distractions. And and so we talked on the one level that HR people individually are managing the paid reality themselves. They're also experiencing this treadmill of pressure and always on an information overload and distraction. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to support others in this space and their paid reality. And so it's really looking at it from both ends and how we are supporting the HR HR team 
on an individual basis and how we can have them support the rest of the organization and, and create some cultural change processes around that, that that can support that through mindfulness, of course. Mm -hmm. That's so important because how can we expect HR professionals to be able to support the rest of the organization if they're completely overwhelmed, understaffed, yeah. and overloaded? And yeah. I love the paid acronym. I think I'm going to have to steal that. <laughs> Absolutely. Please use it because it's something that so many people relate to. I mean, when we're doing trainings or workshops or what have you, um, as soon as we start describing this experience that everybody in any work situation has, people's hands kind of go up and, and say, yep, I'm there. That is me, 24-7 paid reality. We all can experience and relate to that. Uh, and unfortunately, what we're looking at is this is kind of the work reality now, and it's, I don't think it's likely to get better. So again, what we're talking about here is if that's our reality, if that's what's happening to us in our working world externally, and that's impacting our ability to be productive and to be focused and what have you, what can we do in our own minds to help manage that? Because that's kind of the good news of it all. You know, the paid reality might be there, but how we relate to it, how we respond to it, how we work within that, that's our choice. That's where mindfulness kind of can come in and be the key to managing that more effectively. Yes, because a lot of that pressure comes from our minds, doesn't it? Exactly right. It, it, you hit the nail on the head. A lot of the pressure, yep, there's some external pressures, deadlines and what have you. Um, but a lot of it is our perception of that pressure and not only how we experience it ourselves, but then how we kind of push it unconsciously onto others. And, and I do want to kind of put that emphasis on the subconscious because our minds work with a lot of uh, underlying biases that we're not even necessarily aware of a lot of the time. And again, being able to recognize that is another one of those mind training techniques that we really encourage in, in our trainings as a tool. Yeah, and that's really essential that we start to recognize what our mind is doing to us and yeah. being under being more uh, responsive to that in a way that is more productive for us. So can you talk a little bit about maybe some things that people can do when they find themselves like totally under pressure? So of course they're passing it downstream to somebody else and, and making them exactly. nuts. How, yeah. can they, how can they not, how can we not do that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things that we really talk about is busyness being a choice, right? We're again, paid reality invites us to get into a little bit of action addiction, you know, where th things are coming at us and we don't know where to focus. And then it becomes this constant treadmill that we do not know how to get off of. And one of the invitations there is to take a, a pause, to really put a pause button into the day. And they can either be at very strategic moments that you place in your day. So we might suggest you can uh, take a performance break, say once every hour, and just give yourself a little bit of um, time to reset to reduce a little bit of that mental clutter, to gain some renewed energy and clarity and focus to get on to the next task. Um, or you might do it between certain projects. So if you give yourself some real focus time in one area, uh, say you're, you're working on some projects, some spreadsheets, what have you, and then you need to focus on having a crucial conversation with somebody then maybe before you're changing and shifting your focus that's another opportunity to take a performance break so performance breaks are something that um, I think are really really important to kind of put that pause in our minds to refocus and then get us on to the thing that's really really important and not just the things that are really really urgent mm -hmm. yeah yeah, that's really important to do to take those breaks. And even if it's just standing up and stretching, you know, those kind of things can really help. And, you know, I uh, teach some day long courses. And, you know, when I teach those day long courses, you can't expect people to sit at a table and listen to you for eight hours without going insane. So 
do some exercises where we just stand up and stretch and take a break and even just getting up and doing bathroom breaks or going and getting coffee, whatever yeah. it is to take, brings your focus back. But yeah. you can actually see, physically see people's brains just going down the tubes okay. if you don't. And our brains are not built to have sustained focus for eight hours at the no. time. Actually, our brains are wired to have divided focus. It's actually kind of an evolutionary imperative for us as a survival mechanism that we have this distracted focus to just make sure that we're able to pay attention to the possible dangers that could arise in our environment. So it's a little bit how our brain is wired, but as we know in our work reality, we're probably not in any kind of imminent danger that requires all of that distracted focus, and it doesn't help our results. And so what I love what you're saying is, and, and it's kind of very socially acceptable right now to take physical breaks, right? So stretching our, our bodies, moving around, taking bio breaks, that's kind of a given that we're going to do that to help manage um, those long, long hours when we're expected to have some kind of sustained focus. But what we haven't really put into a cultural norm is what does it mean to take a brain break that's not just physical because our minds can still wander when we're wan when we're wandering with our bodies our minds still wander mm -hmm. and so the invitation when it's when we're talking about a performance break is really giving our mind that mental space and so one of the things that we do is we give a very prescribed way of doing a mental performance break you know it can be 3 minutes it can be five minutes. It can be as little as three breaths, though. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is inhaling, noticing where the mental clutter is, noticing if there's any physical stress or tension that you've been holding on to or taking on, again, subconsciously. And then exhaling and kind of releasing all of that, letting it go, becoming more present, and then inhaling and just allowing more space more clarity really focusing in that moment on the breath itself and nothing else and exhaling again allowing that presence to become more grounded and then on your third inhale you're just invoking clarity and maintaining clarity on that exhale so that you can then as you said restart with whatever is coming next that's a really wonderful practice, and I, I really invite people to do just the three breaths to start. I think, you know, yeah. people have a misconception that mindfulness requires, you know, sitting for three hours on the cushion, and most of the people I know who are extremely mindful don't do that. <laughs> it's, it's not a regular part of practice. You may do a retreat, but right. really it's more about the application of mindfulness throughout your day that matters. I wholeheartedly agree. And so doing mindfulness in a formal way is important because it helps rewire the brain, but doing it, it it's, it's only a practice on the cushion if you don't take it out into your every day informally throughout the day. Um, and so, yeah, I agree. It's kind of like asking people to run a marathon the first time and to, to invite them to do anything like a three hour um, meditation sit. Well, that, that's very unrealistic and certainly unrealistic from an organizational and productivity perspective. Yes. Right, because again, no organization is going to necessarily support that. So how do we make it practical? How do we make it sustainable? How yes. do we make it bite-sized so that it's enough to start engaging in the practice? It's enough to start rewiring the brain to be more focused, more clear, uh, to be more aware, because that's key as well. And also, how do we make it more... Um, acceptable and less squishy if you will because it's that people have this concept of okay i can do mindfulness in my personal life but yeah i'm not sure about it in a work context that that's a little too woo woo and so we we're really talking about short sharp interventions that are 
practical, whether it's about how we're conducting our meetings together or how we're communicating with one another, or how we're being more present in the different things that we're doing throughout the day, that's really the informal practice, but that's the main juice that helps us be more effective. Yes, and that's something that you know people don't understand. They're like, oh, when you when you say woo woo, it makes me laugh because people are like, oh no, I'm not going to meditate at my desk. Come on, three breaths. That's all we want. Three breaths, and even that small break can make a big difference. And when you talk about being present, you know, I can't count the number of meetings that I've observed or or been part of where the entire boardroom is on their mobile devices or they're doodling or they're writing, but they're not present. Right. Think how much shorter our meetings would be if we were all actually in the room when we had them. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that we offer in terms of talking about a mindful meeting is a real strategy around if you're present, if you're truly present, if you have a really focused agenda, if everybody who's there really is meant to be there, because we know we in organizations develop these standing meetings and well, let's invite everybody. And then that's not necessarily a good use of everybody's time. Mm -hmm. And if we put these different tips and strategies in place, well, what would it be like if we had a really focused, present, impactful agenda and outcome-driven meeting? We could probably finish earlier than the meeting is actually scheduled to take place. And that is one of the tips as well as end five minutes early, because we know also that organizations, it's just part of our reality we tend to be back to back with meetings. And so, you know, I go in and I, people show me their calendars and the calendar is just full from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it's just meeting, 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 meeting. Well, and then you're trying to fit in the emails. You're trying to fit in, you know, your own lunch in the middle of a meeting and nobody has any mental space throughout the day. So even just five minutes between meetings to have that time to let go of where you were, become present with where you are, and not worrying about what comes next can be a, another great thing. And, and one thing I also wanted to mention, and you were talking about, you know, the woo-woo aspect that can come, um, we don't really use the term uh, meditation or mindfulness as such, because what we're really talking about is how we're training our brains to be more attentive. And it's a little bit like going to the mental gym, right? So it's, it's you're just doing little brain exercises. You're really training that attentional muscle to have that sustained ability to focus and stay on task. And who doesn't want a little bit more of that? Right. Right. And it takes practice. It's not something you can just suddenly start doing. And that's why they call it practice. You need little bits, little bits, little bits until you build up enough that it can be natural and normal for you. Exactly. Exactly right. So let's talk a little bit about how we can spread that awareness through an organization that, say, may have thought that mindfulness is woo woo. How do we bring people to notice? that it doesn't have to be the way that they imagine it to be. Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, we feel is really, really critical and important at Potential Project is, is making it uh, very, very uh, tailored to the work environment. So whether that's tailored to a particular work group uh, within an organization, obviously tailored to that industry, tailored to what the pain points are. What, what is it that's really showing up in terms of uh, the lack of uh, focus or efficiency or, or where, where are they struggling right now? And, and really having that conversation at the outset to set what the outcomes are. 
Mm. So once we have a sense of what that is, we can certainly make uh, recommendations about how to have a sustainable cultural change initiative that's mindfulness based, because we're not interested in just mindfulness for mindfulness sake. There's lots and lots of people out there who are willing to go in and do a little bit of mindfulness training, but it doesn't have any sustainability and it doesn't actually get set into the culture. Mm -hmm. So again, whether we're talking about, well, how we manage our meetings, how we manage our uh, communication, whether that's actual communication or digital communication, um, how we're managing all kinds of things in our work context. And what we do then is we build a program that is over multiple sessions. So people have this opportunity to get on the one hand, uh, what we call a mental strategy. So it's a way of really looking at our brain's default mechanisms that kind of can sabotage our best efforts, whether it's about being present, which we talked about, or maybe engaging in a little more balance, like mental balance with how we focus our day, uh, patience is another one. And then we pair that with the different work techniques and the tools that really help them change the culture as a whole working together. Uh, but it's anchored in the middle with the mind training itself. So the, the opportunity is to get some formal mind training and that the organization then takes on the commitment to do daily training internally as a group. And so we set them up, you know, we have lots and lots of support mechanisms. We lead them through our standard, we call it the, the ABCD method of uh, mind training. Going to the mental gym every day, we recommend about 10 minutes to, to really start rewiring that brain. Um, and then, you know, we support things like apps and uh, internal champions. So it really becomes theirs. Mm. It's not ours anymore. We just give them the foundation. We give them the tools and then they run with it. So that's kind of a, a, a brief of the arc where we go from really understanding where they are, what their needs are, where their pain points are. Uh, and then coming in with a very structured program and sustainability tools, uh, and then giving it over for their ongoing uh, ability to sustain it throughout, throughout the entire organization. Yeah, and I can imagine that's one of the biggest challenges is getting people to continue with uh, mind training once they've spoken with you and they've had a few meetings, the you know 10 minutes turns into five minutes or people stop showing up and you know having those internal champions is absolutely crucial because they can set an example uh, i have seen in organizations where those internal champions whether they're intentionally champions or not people kind of gravitate towards them because they're calmer they're not quite so freaked out and that really helps them to yes. be champions by example you are so correct. And, um, you know, we, we have a little bit of, a, um, we have a challenge sometimes with some of our, our <laughs> groups that we work with because a lot of people, it's kind of a running joke internally, a potential project that a lot of our groups start to, what we, what we notice is that people want to schedule meetings right after the daily training because what we invite is that people do daily training in groups this is part of the sustainability we want to socialize it we know that we're social beings we when when it becomes a norm and everybody kind of has a buy-in for it then they're more willing to do it together and to do it on an ongoing basis so the internal champions are really there to help as, as it says be the champion for this daily practice and so it's kind of built into the schedule it's built into the day and then just as you said people start noticing that those who do the daily tr practice they're calmer they're more focused they're more patient they're more able to be clear in their minds and so you know everybody is kind of competing to see who can schedule the meetings right after the daily practices <laughs> because that's kind of like the best time of the day for most <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting that people want to schedule meetings right after the practice. Um, 
in one respect to me, it's like, yeah, okay, we're done with that. Let's get, to, let's get back to work, which, you know, may or may not be the best approach simply because you're, you're in a really good place. And if you are, that's great. But the people who aren't are like, okay, can we get this done with? Cause I've got a meeting. And how do we tap into those people to kind of bring them around the understanding of what they're doing to themselves? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, it's it's with everything. When Whenever we're introducing something new, there are going to be some people who have, you know, we have a lot of people who come up and they kind of uh, share that in inwardly or in their secret life, they're already doing the mindfulness training. <laughs> And, and they're so excited that it's coming into work because they always knew that this would be a great uh, thing for, for their work environment. Uh, so you have early adopters, people who are just naturally motivated, naturally drawn. They either have their own personal experience or they have a willingness. They've heard about it. They have a curiosity. Mm. And then, you know, it's with any kinds of change, it takes time. And so as you mentioned, you're the one who, who suggested it's a practice, right? So with, with organizational change, it's a practice as well. And we, we know that, you know, the, the research says, not only the research out there, but our research on our programs, we can see the impact, hmm. right? People who are doing this training, even in as little as five weeks, they are reporting higher focus, uh, less multitasking, lower stress, higher productivity, those results carry weight. And even the biggest skeptics, when they see the neuroscience behind it, when they see the research behind it, when they see the impact, not only anecdotally what they're observing, but the research results from this training, that's when they start buying in and they go, mm, maybe there is something to this. Maybe this is worth uh, looking at and, and just trying out again, trying out 10 minutes a day. Most people are willing to give that a try. Right. Right. And you may have data on this as well, that, you know, this makes HR's job easier because a happy, healthy workforce is more likely not only to do a good job, but to stick around because exactly. they are happy with their work environment. Exactly. And, you know, uh, one of the things that Potential Project is looking at right now is not only how it works in an individual and team environment, but as you mentioned, in an organizational environment from a leadership perspective. So uh, we're working on a book right now. It's going to be coming out in early 2018. That's really talking about the minds of the 21st century leader mm. and how the minds can be you know, the key to unlocking organizational excellence from the perspective of happy, engaged employees, those are the ones who are going to stick around. Those are the ones who are going to be internally motivated to do the best that they can do. They're going to be the ones who are actually doing more with less. They're not burning themselves out because they're trying to manage the paid reality externally. They've actually won the game in terms of understanding how to manage the paid reality internally in their own minds first. And so that's, again, that's the best outcome there is if we are helping people to understand how to manage their own minds so they can manage their own paid reality, that really has a major impact across, across an, a culture. Oh, absolutely. I, I think it's absolutely wonderful to hear that organizations are adopting that more and more. And we're also hearing that employees are not satisfied with the same old jobs that, you know, we had in the 60s and 70s and people expected to do whatever it was they were doing without really enjoying it just for the money and the pension at the end. We're not seeing that people are happy with that anymore. They want to be fulfilled in their job. They want to feel valued. And they want to feel happy and maybe not quite in so much stress. Right. And so we're not promising mindfulness is the magic pill to happiness. <laughs> you know the happiness. Yeah, I, I would love to say that. But we do know that um, one of the major outcomes, and, and again, this is kind of going into a little bit of that squishy zone that we want to 
we, we don't want to necessarily um, suggest that we're doing uh, training on self-compassion, but when we're more mindful, we tend to be more kind to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when we're kind to ourselves, we tend to be kind to others. And isn't that a great strategy to have for an organization is we may not say that that's a strategic imperative that we put in our goals for 2017 kindness to self and others but the impact of kindness to self and others in an organizational context is really immeasurable in some ways because people work better together people are and neurologically when you're feeling good about yourself you learn better you communicate better um, and you're more focused you're not worried about the stress all the time which just really eats up our mental bandwidth um, so again we don't necessarily go in saying um, we're going to teach all of your people to be kind <laughs> but we do go in and and we say understanding ourselves can have a real benefit that goes beyond just these targeted results Yes, yes. And I, I am a big fan of compassion for self and others and also, you know, loving kindness practice. And even if, you know, you're sitting in your cube and people are walking by and when every person who walks by in a five minute period, you just wish them to be happy, to be healthy, to be safe. It's very easy to do loving kindness practice in an office with nobody knowing and yes makes you feel good and even if they don't know why it makes the other person feel good too exactly. because that energy does transfer absolutely absolutely and at the end of the day we all want the same things we all you know we don't we all want to be happy nobody wants pain nobody wants suffering and so how can we help each other towards that unified goal which actually is a, a great business objective as well even if it's not not the overall objective, but we recognize that that can help with uh, a lot of the collaboration and a lot of uh, the, the strategic imperatives of what we're looking at. Absolutely true. Absolutely. Well, Marissa, it's been just lovely chatting with you. And, and I would love to let people know how to find more information about you. So why don't you let people know how to find you? Well, one thing I would offer is you can go to our website. So our website is www.potentialproject.com. Potential Project, all one word. And uh, there you can read more about us, um, take a look at some of our case studies with some of the work that we've done with uh, other major organizations. Uh, you can find my direct email and, and link under About Us for uh, the USA, uh, and also learn about our book, uh, One Second Ahead. Uh, so that's the first book. It came out in, uh, just over a year ago now with some of the techniques that I described in, in our call today. Um, yeah, and we also have, I would also suggest that um, we have an assessment uh, online right now, and, and the assessment is a real nice way of getting a sense of where you are in the paid reality. And so it, it really, it asks, it's a quick assessment, it's about five minutes long. Um, it's been sponsored uh, by Harvard Business Review, so it's um, something that's, again, a lot of research around how do we assess our mind state and the impact that that has on our day to day. So that's a nice way of kind of getting started too. Well, that's wonderful. And I'll make sure that I link to that in the blog post. And just to Great. let people know, this will be on the website, mindfulsocialmarketing.com. It'll also be on my YouTube channel. And then I'm syndicating the podcast across multiple platforms. So probably anything that you listen to podcasts on, you can listen to this on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janet. I really enjoyed our time today. Thank you. So did I. Have a great rest of your day, Marissa. You too.